Hello once again. Now let's study about the cerebrospinal fluid and uh, what is its significance and how, uh, in what conditions or in what um, uh, levels do we examine the cerebrospinal fluid. So, the, the purpose of the cerebrospinal fluid is to cushion, it's to cushion the central nervous system and um, it will also provide nutrition to the central nervous system. So, as we know the central nervous system would uh, consist of the brain matter and the spinal cord. So, where does this cerebrospinal fluid originate? So, the CSF is synthesized by the choroid plexus in the ventricles and it circulates out to the subarachnoid spaces uh, surrounding the central nervous system. Now, what is the function of the CSF? It protects and cushions the uh, central nervous system and it also provides nutrients to the neural tissues and it removes metabolic waste. So, three functions, one is protection and cushioning of the central nervous system, providing the nutrients to the uh, tissues of the central nervous system as well as removing the metabolic waste. Now, approximately around 500 milliliters per day is produced, milliliter of CSF is produced by the choroid plexus in the... Now, let's just look at a diagram of where the choroid plexus is present and uh, where the subarachnoid space. So, this is a diagram, uh, uh, a diagram of the brain structure. So, the choroid uh, plexus is present here and the movement of the CSF is from in within to the outside. So, this area is known as the subarachnoid space. So, it will move down into the, the canal which holds the spinal cord. So, join, it is a diagram that shows both the brain as well as the spinal cord and this will be the, uh, the canal through which the spinal cord is present and the, the CSF will be surrounding the spinal cord. So, here the CSF will be surrounding the spinal cord. Now, the specimen collection is only for diagnostic purpose or for treatment of the disease. Now, the, uh, in order to take the CSF, the spinal, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, in order to remove, uh, take a, uh, a sample of it from the body, uh, a procedure called as sterile lumbar puncture needs to be done. So, it's a ventricular puncture and it is done between the vertebras L2 and L3 or between the L3 and the L4. Now, the purpose of uh, having uh, or doing it from such a location of the vertebra is because there is less chances of the spinal cord of, of being, um, of being uh, touched by the needle or being punctured by the needle. So, this is and this is and the CSF is present in the lumbar cistern of the subarachnoid space which surrounds the spinal cord. So, this is the diagram of the lumbar puncture where the vertebras L3, L4, L5 are present in the lower portion of the lower portion of the or the lower back. So, the, need, the spinal needle is a specific, is a special type of a needle and that is inserted between the vertebras and then we see that because of the pressure of the fluid or the CSF flowing, it will be, uh, it will be pushed into the spinal needle and then it will, uh, on opening up the valve, it will be collected into a, a sterile container. So, there will be collect three ty types of collection for the CSF. The CSF will be collected in, into three tubes tube number 1, 2 and 3. So, each tube has its own uh, purposes. So, the first tube is used for CSF chemistry analysis. So, this tube contains the tissue juice and some cells from the spinal tap. Now, the second tube is used for microbiological studies. So, tube 3 is used uh, for hemocytometer cell count and cytospin differential. So, what we need to uh, take care is that there, there, the needle does not puncture any area um, that is surrounding the cerebrospinal fluid because cells from the, um, from the area surrounding the cerebrospinal fluid should not enter, uh, should not be present inside the, uh, inside the CSF. So, whatever cells are obtained or whatever cells are, have been observed in the CSF will then belong to only the CSF and not because of any uh, puncture or failure. 
Now the physical examination of CSF may be done using this uh, tube 3. And uh, testing of CSF uh, should be done immediately uh, upon being received to the lab because there will be uh, rapid cellular degeneration. So this is a diagram or this is a picture of the cytospin centrifuge. So we see that it is a different from the normal centrifuges. And let's uh, have a look at how the attachment of the small tube is connected to that of the slide. So this is a part of the cytospin slide. So we have a funnel, then there will be a foam receptacle, then a tissue paper and a metal clip. So uh, the photos of it is, is given in this on this slide. So we have a holder, a slide, a filter card and a funnel. So this is how the filter card is kept within the holder and, uh, the, and also the funnel is placed here. So uh, upon joining the filter and uh, the slide and the funnel, we'll have to close the, me the metal holder. So this as a total unit will be placed inside the cytospin centrifuge. So the purpose of using the cytospin centrifuge is in order to separate out the cells very well on, onto a slide and therefore we're using a centrifuge method. Now the diseases or the pathological diseases which are involved with CSF are the subarachinoid or intracellular hemorrhage, example a stroke or a trauma, then there will be bacterial infections such as the meningitis, bacterial fungal parasitic or even viral uh, infections, then there will be abscess and encephalitis, then malignant process such as primary brain tumor, metastatic tumors and uh, leukemias, lymphomas and multiple sclerosis. So different kinds of pathological diseases associated with CSF, uh, the subarachinoid or intracellular hemorrhage such as stroke then infections which could be bacterial, fungi or uh, uh, even parasitic, then um, uh, cancerous uh, uh, tumors um, such as the metastatic tumor, the leukomas, the lymphomas and the multiple sclerosis. Now when we do a CSF analysis, uh, there can be three ways on which CSF can be analyzed. It can be a physical examination, chemical and microscopic analysis. So uh, the gross examination of CSF is done based on color and clarity of the specimen. So if you see a CSF liquid, it is clear and colorless. Now if there is turbidity present, which means there is, there is presence of cells. So turbidity is often produced by the increased presence of WBCs. If it is more than 200 cells per ml or by increased presence of RBCs, that will be around greater than 400 cells per ml or even by the presence of microorganisms. So if the turbidity in CSF is known as pleocytosis. So based on color, so usually uh, we said that the, uh, a, a normal CSF will look colorless, but if the CSF is having a pink or a red color, so that will be because of RBC lysis and it can be seen four to 10 hours after a subarachinoid hemorrhage. So if there is, has been a hemorrhage in the subarachinoid region, so the RBC lysis would have taken place and therefore the CSF is now colored. Or it could be even due to a traumatic tap, like while, uh, uh, while the procedure of lumbar puncture has happened, there could be some, uh, some sort of uh, uh, damage in that place and therefore there could have been lysis of the RBCs. Then uh, if the CSF is yellow in color, so that would, the term that we use is called as xanthochromic. So the specimen, uh, the conditions that would cause a yellow color could be because of um, uh, the bilirubin formation that is seen in CSF due to the breakdown of hemoglobin. So if there's increased bilirubin formation in the CSF because of a break, uh, breakdown of hemoglobin caused by some bleeding, that could cause a yellow color. Then if the proteins in the CSF is more than 250 milligram per deciliter, again that will lead to a yellow color or if it could be due to any liver disease. So in which the total bilirubin level is high or in, has increased. So this could also cause a yellow color CSF. 
Now there can be occasions in which we can we will be finding a brown CSF. So the instances where brown CSF is found is when there could be presence of meth hemoglobin or subdural or intracerebral uh, hematoma or presence of melanin caused by melanoma. Melanoma is a cancer uh, of the melanin cells. So uh, brown specimens are seen when there could be a met hemoglobin present or due to an intracerebral hematoma or due to the presence of melanin obtained from melanoma cancer. Now uh, uh, the, the color differences or the bleeding that has been caused uh, in the CSF could either be because of a pathological bleeding or it could be due to a traumatic tap. So in order to differentiate this, we need to examine the CSF and find out the components in CSF and then we can say if it is due to uh, uh, an actual disease or a disorder or if it's due to a, a mechanical traumatic uh, tap incident. So if there is a, a serial increase, uh, a serial decrease in RBCs in tube 1 to 3, that is caused due to a traumatic tap. And if there is a clotted specimen or clumped RBCs on microscope, this also could be due to a traumatic tap. Then the color of the supernatant of the bloody specimen after centrifugation, uh, based on the color of the supernatant. So if it is a clear supernatant, it's a traumatic tap. But if the supernatant has a pink, yellow or brown color, it could be due to a pathological bleeding. So this will help in uh, diagnosis of CSF because uh, merely seeing uh, color or merely counting the number of cells and all may lead to a confusion. So in order to prevent the confusion and to correctly distinguish it between a traumatic tap uh, uh, cost um, increase in the, uh, in the components or if it is actually due to a pathological bleeding it could be based on these factors. So also the ratio of uh, the, uh, if the ratio is greater of 500 RBCs for every WBC, that could also indicate a traumatic trap. Now we will look into the chemical examination of CSF. So let's look into how to examine the proteins. Now there, will, there, are, there are some kinds of proteins which are present in the CSF. So those are the prealbumin, albumin, transferrin and trace amounts of immunoglobulin. So the kinds of proteins present in the CSF are prealbumin, albumin, transferrin and trace amounts of immunoglobulin. So usually the percentage of albumin, uh, CSF protein ranges from 20 and 50 milligram per deciliter and with albumin presenting from 50 to 50% 50 to 70% of the total amount of proteins. Now if there has been uh, an increase in the amount of proteins greater than this value, that means if the albumin content has become more than 50 to 70 percent of the total, that is because the, uh, the blood brain barrier has been damaged. So usually all the large molecules are kept out of CSF. So, so we don't have large protein molecules in the CSF, but if there has been uh, injury or if there has been uh, a leak in the blood brain barrier, we can found increased amounts of albumin, which is greater than 50 to 70 percent of the total proteins. So when does the uh, protein levels increase in the CSF? So if there has been contamination with peripheral blood while obtaining the specimen or if there has been obstruction of CSF circulation which could be because of a tumor present in the, uh, in, in the uh, central nervous system or if there has been a tissue degeneration or if there has been an increased permeability of the blood brain membrane itself. So the permeability has, could have been changed because of the presence of some drugs or toxins or infections such as meningitis or it could be intrathecal production of protein by tumors. So the various reasons why we have increased protein levels in CSF, the first one is um, a contamination procedure, uh, uh, a contamination that has occurred while removing the uh, CSF fluid out. 
then or due to cons uh, obstruction of CSF circulation because of a tumor, then a tissue degeneration or um, uh, disease or uh, permeability of the uh, of the blood brain barrier or the blood brain membrane has become more than what it should be because that could have been caused by drugs or toxins or infection and it could be because of a, the tumors present within the brain now if we check the individual components of the proteins that is also helpful in diagnosing because if we uh, look at the pre albumin level we see that this protein is present in the csf but if there has been an increase in the albumin level so this would cause would be caused due to a damage in the blood brain barrier so uh, that is a uh, so checking out the totality of the protein content itself is not important is but in checking out the individual types of proteins and their uh, concentrations is important to find out uh, uh, or for proper diagnosis then immunoglobulin is present in trace amounts and um, if it has is if the immunoglobulin level is more it could be because of an intrathecal production so this is seen if there is cases of tumors in the brain then uh, the csf serum immunoglobulin index is less than 0.77 this is a normal index but if the index has is greater than 0.77 it is indicative of multiple sclerosis now the, you can also do a protein electrophoresis so to uh, this helps in distinguishing the different kinds of proteins present then uh, uh, as we know electrophoresis protein electrophoresis is a is a way of checking out the different proteins present in a solution uh, because the proteins would move in the if given in an electric field in a in a put in a gel and uh, the proteins move according to their charges and according to their molecular weights so uh, based on the um, the kind of bands which have been obtained on the gel uh, we will be able to see uh, or to check out if there has been uh, the case of a disease. So if there is an abnormal oligoclonal band seen in the gamma region, it consists of immunoglobulin G, it is highly diagnostic of multiple sclerosis. Then we have proteins such as the myelin, basic proteins. If, the, if such kind of proteins are present, it indicates again a multiple sclerosis. Now the glucose present in the CSF. So the normal values of glucose uh, in the CSF ranges from 50 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. Then it is approximately 60% of the plasma glucose levels. So the value of glucose in the CSF is between 50 to 80 milligram per deciliter and that would be around 60% of the plasma glucose levels. Now when there has been an infection the levels have been uh, levels would be decreased uh, infections due to bacterial meningitis or fungal infections now if there is an increase in the glucose level it could be because of hyperglycemia or in the case of a traumatic tap now there are certain enzymes which are present in the csf and we can um, diagnose or we can check out the presence of those enzymes and uh, and see if that is an indicator of some uh, disease or, or, or a, uh, a disorder condition. So one, one, enzyme, such, one such enzyme is the lacto, uh, lactose dehydrogenase. So the concentrations can be elevated when we have a bacterial viral infections, when there is a hemorrhage in the subarachnoid region, when there are lymphomas in case of leukemias and in the case of metastatic tumors. So the lactose dehydrogenase enzyme. So the uh, level of lactose dehydrogenase enzyme will be high if there is an infection with a particular organism or if there is a hemorrhage, if there are lymphomas, if there are leukemias or if there are tumors. Now the creatine kinase, the CK uh, enzyme levels could also be seen if there has been a case of stroke, multiple sclerosis, degenerative disorders, brain tumors, again a, a bacterial viral infection or if there has been an epileptic seizure. Then another type of enzyme is the aspartate aminotransferase, AST 
enzyme aspartate aminotransferase levels can be seen high if there is intracellular hemorrhage, if there is subarachinoid hemorrhage or if there is a meningitis caused by. If the lactic acid concentration is usually between 10 to 22 milligram per deciliter but if the lactate is concentration of lactate is more that could be because of increased metabolism or ischemic in the C CNS in the central nervous system. So these two uh, causes, these two uh, uh, conditions will cause an increase in the CSF lactic acid levels. So uh, we will look into the cell count in the CSF. So uh, usually the lymphocytes and the monocytes uh, levels should be less, uh, should be in a low concentration of 0 to 10 cells per microliter. So if you check out the percentage of the cells, Neutrophils would be between 0% to 6%, monocytes would be between 15% to 45% and the lymphocytes would be between 40% to 80%. Now the RBCs should ideally be absent and if it, the RBCs are present, it could show a case of cerebral hemorrhage or a traumatic tap. Then uh, the cell count procedures should always be done within one hour of CSF collection. Now we also saw that we can do a cytospin smear procedure in order to do a WBC differential count. So the stain that is used is the right stain. Now if the in neutrophil levels have been increased that could indicate the case of a meningitis. It's a bacterial meningitis and if the lymphocytes have been increased it could be a case of viral tubercular or fungal meningitis. So if it is neutrophil numbers are more, it, it is a bacterial meningitis. The lymphocytes numbers are more, it could be a viral tubercular or fungal meningitis. So let's again look at the presence of the different kinds of the cells and what conditions they indicate. So if we have presence of plasma cells, it would be an indication of multiple sclerosis or chronic inflammatory conditions. If the presence of eosinophils, it could be a parasitic infection or fungal disorder. If this presence of macrophages, it could be found if there is a hemorrhage. And if we see ferritin granules in the cytoplasm of CSF macrophages, it could be a chronic hemorrhagic condition. Then if we have presence of malignant cells, that would obviously indicate a tumorous growth. Tumor a metastatic tumor or a leukemia process. Now we can also do a microscopic examination of the CSF. So we will do with the, uh, we will deal with the details of these organisms when we take a class on the microbiology aspect. But for now we will look into the different types of uh, uh, organisms that could lead to a meningitis condition. So we have cryptococcus species, cochidioma, uh, cochidioris, emitis, then Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is a bacteria. Uh, these two form a fungus. Then uh, Haemophilus influenza is a bacteria, Neisseria meningitis, Streptococcus pneumonia, Staphylococcus aureus, all these are bacteria and these two are fungal. Thank you.